Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here alone, as promised, though a little late. Well, not quite alone. Maybe he may be able to hear my cat in the background. Um, only the loud one, though. Uh, all right, so I apologize. I said I'd get this out over the weekend. I didn't, obviously. Um, and uh, I did say, though, that I'm a terrible procrastinator. Um, from another perspective, you could say I'm an excellent procrastinator, though. So, you know, kind of depends. And the people that know me, this is my excuse. Um, the people that know me personally will be like, yep. Um, most of you don't, though, so let me try to explain. Uh, once I um, start down a path of some research, uh, I continually, well, I get distracted easily. Like, okay, I've been reading a bunch about this thing, but then there's this topic that comes up within the context of that that interests me, and I go down the rabbit hole for a little while, and then uh, I find my way back, or I discover new aspects of it that I wasn't aware of before, and try to figure out how to incorporate it into what I had planned to say, or, and then I debate about how much detail you guys want. And sometimes I'm reading things that I, that I know that I'm not going to include, but, um, I just want to have a better understanding of it because it's related to what I'm talking about. And anyway, this is why I could never turn anything in on time when I was in school. Uh, is that I just, um, I, I have a broad range of interests and new things interest me. And so, uh, I, I can kind of get lost once I start reading about a topic. And so that's the excuse that I'm going to go with here. Um, I got a, uh, a book on Saturday, um, that's a collection of Cecilia Farber's writings on the, um, AIDS stuff and, I, I honestly, you're probably lucky that I'm putting this out before I actually read that book. All I did was reread an old article um, that was published in Spin that I've talked about on the podcast before called Sins of Omission. Um, but I, I guess he, here we go. And I'm honest, I, I have dropped the Israel part of this, we'll call it a presentation entirely because there's no way no way that I'll have time or at least time in the sense that I want to con keep talking by myself. Um, cause you know, these things up being a little bit shorter when I don't have Gary to fill in the spaces so that I can, you know, drink my water, take a breath, recollect myself, etc. This ends up being more like a, a like a, a lecture or a speech or something. And, um, so they, they tend to be shorter cause I don't have anybody to fill in the gaps while I do other things, which means that I'm the only person that can do anything for the next, however long this takes me. And, um, I'll get tired of it at some point, but I, I did, I definitely wanted to focus on the corruption of, I thought about talking about the whole medical system, uh, in the U S but I'm, I'm going to try and stick to just the corruption of public health um, in the U.S. And so I've broken it down into three primary um, methods, I guess, um, through which the, the public health system has been corrupted. And uh, so we'll, we'll take them one at a time, and, and hopefully I'll be able to lay out a pretty clear picture to you of why government is terrible at everything. And, you know, really to sum up, it's that uh, government agencies exist essentially to perpetuate themselves like, I don't know, like uh, philosophy professors. Yeah. And um, that as, 
I'm, I'm like staring over at my bookshelf trying to remember the author's name here. Um, anyway, uh, the guy who wrote Democracy, The God That Failed, it'll come to me eventually, as he was pointing out in his book that the incentives for public officials in a democracy are to um, plunder the American taxpayer or plunder the taxpayer as best they can during the time that they hold office. And um, just because they're technically public health, that doesn't, that doesn't change that. Corruption seeps into everything, especially the people that have the power to kind of direct where money goes, which is kind of the issue here. And so let's start with, um, and I'm going to focus mostly on the NIH because I found a nifty tool and I'll reference it more later. But the NIH uses public funds, taxpayer funds, our money, um, to uh, fund research and development of new pharmaceutical products. And um, so it, it... literally gives out money to uh, both to itself and to other investigators and to pharma companies um, to develop particular products or treatments for particular um, ailments. And, and it retains the patents, at least in part. And that it retains the patents not so that it can refund the taxpayers the investment that we provided to develop the product, uh, but to enrich themselves and to enrich the pharmaceutical companies that they license the products to. And there's a lot of money in this. Um, uh, Officials like Fauci or former officials like Fauci uh, use their positions in the public health eye as marketers for these products. Um, and there's, in all of these various diseases, especially the pandemics, and I, this is going to come up over and over again, but I, I may as well say you should never buy from somebody who's selling fear. And that's what they try and, and sell with all of these things, whether it be um, AIDS or the swine flu or Zika or dengue, or COVID, or the bird flu, or Ebola, or what, whatever the disease du jour is that they're trying to get you worked up about to get you to go out and buy medical products. You should never buy from somebody who's selling fear. But all these things generate a tremendous amount of money for this industry. Um, there, there's money in testing, there's money in diagnostics, there's obviously money in treatments or purported treatments. Um, and so all of these, these aspects benefit from you being afraid of something, whether you need to be or not. And <clears throat> so as an example, AZT was one of the early treatments for AIDS. And uh, AZT was originally developed as a chemotherapy through an NIH grant uh, in 1964. And it's, it's a DNA chain terminator. Um, it, so it functions by preventing the replication of cells, or it kills cells that are replicating, that are dividing. But it kills those cells indiscriminately. So any cells that are replicating, it kills. So originally when it was developed as a chemotherapy, it was thrown on the scrap heap because it was so toxic um, that it was doing more harm than good. Um, It was supposed to be a cancer treatment originally. And at the time, there was a a wide belief that cancer was caused by retroviruses. And um, so anyway, originally it it was just thrown off as a, a waste. Um, that that wasn't good for treating anything because it was because of the extreme toxicity. But when HIV came around, um, it was rejuvenated because here's a new retrovirus that we can use to um, this drug that we spent a bunch of money developing to treat. And um, that 
the NIH had a lot of money involved in this and some reputations as well. Um, Robert Gallo, um, an MD at NIH, claimed um, to be the discoverer of the HIV virus that caused AIDS, uh, although he actually stole that discovery from a guy, um, Luc Montagnier, who sent um, Gallo a sample of the virus, and then Gallo tried to claim the discovery for himself. This is the quality of people that, that work in public health even back then. And um, <clears throat> so in the 80s, it was, it, AIDS was, uh, it was approved to treat AIDS. It was approved by the FDA in 1987. It was based on a single study uh, that's now considered completely invalid. Um, the study unblind, it was supposed to be a, a double blind placebo controlled. The, even as Fauci says, the, the gold standard of testing, but it was unblinded early. Um, the placebo controls were eliminated. Uh, they ended up halting the, the trial after 17 weeks. It was supposed to be a 36 week trial. Coincidentally, the positive effects of AZT um, tend to disappear after around, or, or decline after around 16 weeks and disappear entirely by 24 weeks. So I'm sure it was just coincidental that they stopped the study just in time, just at that last moment where AZT actually showed that it was keeping people alive as compared to the placebo. Uh, because within a year... So when you're talking about 52 weeks, that seems to be, the opposite seems to be true. AZT seemed to be killing more people than not taking AZT at all. They had a lot of uh, doctors that were treating HIV successfully, or AIDS, HIV AIDS successfully without AZT. They were treating um, the opportunistic infections, which is what actually kills you. Um... One of the primary ones is PCP. It's a form of pneumonia. Uh, there's also uh, is it Carposi sarcoma. Um, but you had doctors that were treating these opportunistic infections and keeping their patients alive um, more effectively than, um, than people that were pushing AZT. But uh, Fauci, among others at, at NIH and IAID, were pushing AZT pretty hard, um, preventing the uh, approval of these alternative drugs that were already on the market that were being used to treat the opportunistic infections. And um, a later NIH study, uh, again touted by Fauci, uh, divided the um, patients into two groups based on some clinical signs. Um, one group uh, showed no difference in disease progression, um, but the other group... Um, there was a difference in disease progression based on AZT use. And they made a big issue out of that, um, that 36 of the 900 infected patients in the second group uh, developed AIDS from their HIV, while 38 of 450 in the placebo, so about the same number, but with half as many participants in the placebo, um, their disease progressed to uh, AIDS. But what they ignore is that a, a bunch of the patients in the AZT group had dropped out of the study due to the drug intolerance, so they didn't count them. Um, the, and extrapolated out across the whole the, the difference between the AZT treatment and no treatment at all was like if you include the second group in 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 the whole study um, or the first group, the, I'm talking about the second group, then there wasn't really a significant difference. And um, so, you know, some of these things probably sound familiar, but we'll, we'll take the, the second aspect, the second way in which the public health is, is corrupted. Um, the... Clinical trials themselves have become a huge industry, uh, a huge moneymaker within the medical field. Um, they profit almost everybody. 
They profit the pharmaceutical companies that develop it. They profit the doctors who find patients to participate in the studies. They profit the principal investigators that are paid to conduct the studies. Um, the patients sometimes get a little bit. and But mostly the patients are induced into participating in the studies with the promise of free drugs. That sounds different than the way I mean it, I think. Um, with the promise of free treatment for uh, an illness... Yeah, we'll just say it that way. Um, promise of free treatment for an illness. But the the studies are designed in such a way that they beg the question. Like they that they assume that the drug is effective and safe from the beginning, and they set out to prove that rather than to test that. Um, and the reason for this is that the principal investigators are more likely to be paid in the future to do more studies if their studies result in the approval, the FDA approval of the drugs that they're testing. So they're incentivized to, um, to create a study where the drugs will be approved so that they can get more funding for further studies for other drugs in the future. The, um, and so there's a whole bunch of problems with these trials that are conducted. Um, there was a, another... Uh, uh, another uh, uh, AIDS drug, um, AIDS treatment called nevirapine, nevirapine, I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, anyway, that uh, was developed in the late 90s. So we have AZT in the mid 80s, uh, nevirapine, which is how I'm going to say it, in the late 90s. And um, they conducted tests that this drug was supposed to reduce the transfer of an infection from a mother to a child during pregnancy. And, of course, it showed to be effective, but, um, again, it was a drug that, that wasn't much used in the, United, in the United States after the trials because of the severe toxicity. And uh, to summarize that, in the course of the trials in the U.S., they killed several mothers and a few babies, too. And then beyond that, um, when they moved the trials over to Africa, um, they continued to, to kill mothers and children. And to redefine what they, was considered adverse events, and they, uh, again, didn't conduct the trials with uh, double-blind placebo control. A really infamous one of these is uh, HIV net 12, so HIV NET 012. Look it up. It's horrifying. Um, but the, the, this drug caused liver failure, and they even had patients coming in in the U.S., uh, you know, American women, not that it should make any difference, but it probably does to some people, um, American women coming in presenting with really obvious signs of liver failure and they continued to um, treat them with this drug, even, even though they knew this was a possible side effect, um, down to the point where some of them had hepatic failure and, and died. Um, and then, like I said, in Africa, they had some real issues with... Well, let me back off of this particular study and go back to, to these studies generally. And just say that since they're designed to prove the efficacy and safety of the drugs, um, they have real issues with um, with losing the blinding corruption of the blinding um, and the randomization. The uh, placebos, the control groups are eliminated. Um, the trials are shortened to achieve the desired result. Uh, the data, data ends up being cherry-picked. Um, it's it, it's corrupt really from top to bottom, and some of this stuff probably sounds really familiar to you uh, in terms of COVID. So, similarly, the um, during COVID, the uh, there was a lot of money made on tests. Um, they were suppressing. Uh, the cheap off-patent treatments uh, such as um, ivermectin um, and 
you know, other options. I don't know if I can still, if I can say that and still be, have, keep this up on YouTube, but oh well. Um, the, uh, so yeah, they're, they're suppressing the cheap off patent treatments. Um, they're promoting an older drug that was, uh, thrown on the scrap heap due to its toxicity in the case of, of remdesivir. Uh, I, I'm sure I've talked about this before, but there might be new people here. Um, the, uh, in fact, I'm sure that there are, uh, remdesivir was originally developed as an Ebola treatment, but it had such severe toxicity. Uh, again, this is, um, generally liver and kidney issues that, it, that it causes, uh, it had such a severe toxicity that they stopped using it as a treatment for Ebola. Now you have to think about how bad the outcomes of the use of a drug have to be before you stop using it to treat Ebola. Now it was in comparison to another drug that also had bad outcomes, but not as bad as remdesivir. So the um, NIH, again, had spent a bunch of money on development of a drug that they couldn't use for anything, and they saw COVID as an opportunity to push a drug that they had already invested in um, that I'm confident uh, patents were held by individuals within NIH, um, and they needed a way to unload a drug that they'd already produced. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and they used this as an opportunity. And again, they um, they designed trials with remdesivir to, to prove its effectiveness rather than to test it. Um, trials that were done other places that weren't as corrupt, um, uh, trials in Europe and so forth, did not show remdesivir to be effective. The WHO dropped use of remdesivir to treat COVID before the U.S. did. I had a, a good friend of mine. Um, her father had dementia, and he'd had a fall. And so since he wasn't really able to effectively communicate what problems he might have or what injuries he might have, they took him to the hospital to get him checked out. This is during the era that everybody that went into the hospital got a COVID test. And he came up positive for COVID. Um, according to my friend, there was no, he didn't have any, um, any symptoms of COVID before they took him in, but he'd had this fall. So that could have been a result of the weakness or, you know, some of the symptoms of COVID, but there's no evidence of that anyway. But they took him into the hospital to get him checked out to make sure that he hadn't injured himself um, in a way that he couldn't express in his fall. And they found out that he had COVID and they put him on remdesivir. And when my friend told me this, I told her, get him off this drug. Like, you have some control over treatment here. Get him off this drug. This drug is dangerous. Um, and I told her about the background that, you know, that it had been developed for Ebola, but um, that it had such a high toxicity that they didn't, they couldn't use it for Ebola, and that it was a uh, frankly criminal that they were pushing it to treat COVID at this point, and that the trials that showed that it was it, you know, it, it reduced symptoms quicker than a placebo uh, had been kind of doctored, I guess to to use that term. Um, whereas they they weren't randomized; they were giving the drug to. Um, people who had, who were in at less risk than the people that they were given the placebo to and so forth. They were trying to push the trial to, um, again, to achieve a specific result, that being approval, uh, for use of this drug. And, um, she's a person that's always going to look into things herself. And I, I'm not entirely sure what happened from there, but, uh, a week later, she let me know that her father had died in the hospital. And I can't know this for sure, but I hold remdesivir responsible. The man wasn't that sick except for the dementia when he went into the hospital. And so, uh, anyway, um, I don't mean to go down this path. And, and just, uh, as a side note, the replacement for Fauci, I can't think of her name right now. She was one of these principal investigators. Um, she was one of his principal investigators for years. So I doubt that the system's going to change any now. And 
there was a, a guy who they hired, uh, I guess in the early 2000s, um, named Fishbein that the NIH hired to oversee their clinical trials. And um, he was going in there thinking that um, his job would actually be to make sure that all these clinical trials fo followed all the rules that they were supposed to follow and were designed effectively to test um, safety and efficacy and so forth. And what he found out when he got there is that he, what he was supposed to do is just rubber stamp everything, um, that he wasn't actually supposed to do the job that he was hired to do because that might reflect poorly on the NIH. And they eventually um, forced him out. So he, um, he, he brought up some problems with some of these trials. He wouldn't... Um, for example, in the nevirapine trial um, that were done in the U.S., he, he wouldn't sign off that it was the doctor's treatment that was at fault rather than the drug itself, um, that he uh, got involved in the, uh, in the HivNet um, controversy and uh, was identifying all the problems with the trials. Um, he was causing some problems. And so they, um, they, they pushed him out. And initially, he uh, petitioned for um, whistleblower protections, which he received. And so they had to uh, draw back some of the, the, the claims that they'd made against him um, trying to get rid of him. Um, but of course, like once you've found yourself in that position in an organization, you can't really continue working there. And so they ended up um, settling. Uh, and I, the, the details of the se settlement are unknown. So, But they did succeed in forcing this guy out so they could continue doing these corrupt trial uh, setups, corrupt trial designs. Um, and they continued to do it through the COVID. If you... Remember, they shortened uh, the mRNA trials. Um, they reduced the, the time that they were supposed to run the trials for, uh, supposedly to that they'd showed efficacy at this point, and so they needed to get that treatment out as quickly as possible because we were in the middle of a pandemic. Um, but it was really so that they could cover up the long-term effects of the, of the drug itself because they didn't know... For example, once they injected this mRNA into your system and your body started producing the spike protein, they didn't know how long your body would continue to produce the spike protein. So in the early stages, well, we see that there's some effectiveness of the drug and the safety problems haven't arisen yet. Let's go ahead and close down the trial and then we can... Um, we can put our, together our statistics to show how effective they are. You remember those numbers at the beginning, like 95% effective and so forth? The, the uh, paper that came out in January this year that was then retracted by the editors of the uh, journal um, that we talked about, it, it talked about how like once you calculated in everything that should be included, I mean... The whole trial, the way it was done, is uh, an example of Mark Twain's line about three kinds of lies. It's like an illustration of the lies, damn lies, and the statistics. And so, um, in the uh, in the paper that that criticized the way the trials were put on that came out earlier this year, they talked about once you calculate in all of the things that you're supposed to calculate when you're determining the efficacy of a drug it wasn't 95% effective or it was more like 19% effective, which is obviously terrible. And considering the potential side effects, especially for young, healthy people, nobody would have taken that <laughs> if they had known. Um, this is like false advertising of the worst kind. And uh, I, I got a little distracted here, but um, the... Uh, they also, in terms of the trials, they refused to sponsor. This is what the NIH really should do. If it, was, if it was a legitimate public service, it would do things like this, which um, 
which is to sponsor trials of cheap off patent drugs so that we knew potential treatments that were inexpensive for people. Because, of course, the big industries, they're not going to pay for studies for drugs that they can't really make money on. That makes sense. Um, but, of course, doctors can still try these things out, and, and there's just not going to be... They can run in their own little trials, but um, the big drug companies aren't going to, to pay for a trial for a drug that, that's off patent. But the NIH could. There's no reason the NIH shouldn't do that. That would be an effective use of our taxpayer money is to try and find inexpensive ways to treat things with our money. Well, better than what they're doing with it. But they refuse to sponsor trials of cheap off-patent drugs. Um, they, uh, and in fact, the trials that do arise or the word of mouth from treating physicians that says that these things work, especially in the case of COVID, they're actively suppressing, speaking out against um, covering up online here, there, and everywhere, um, censoring or pressuring social media to censor posts from doctors that were, um, were offering alternative treatments from remdesivir or the mRNA. Because the truth is that the, these NIH, um, guys are, are profiting off of these big drugs. They're working with the drug companies so that they can all make money. This makes it sound like I'm against making money, which I'm not. I'm against using public funds to make money for private uh, groups. It's something that we've railed on a lot here um, is privatizing public funds. And this is another example of that. So anyway, um, and this this trials and so forth this is the this leads to the third way in which the the uh, public health system has been corrupted or the the third way that it manifests is that the NIH controls the message um, and the treatment through the funding for this research uh, they um, ensure compliance of the central control through the through all this funding Um, For example, I had a friend, uh, yeah, I had a friend that worked at Tulane Medical Center during COVID. And um, as as a physician, as a medical doctor, and we argued about the effectiveness of the COVID treatments. And um, we also argued about uh, the um, gender, uh, gender affirming care, which they were on board with and I'm not. And so it made me think of this. A few months ago, I saw that the NIH had awarded Tulane um, a big grant to study gender affirming treatments, um, which was like, it was like $400 million over eight years or something like that. And so I started thinking about it and I wish I'd had that, this information when I was arguing about the COVID vaccines and um, the lack of treatment. In fact, this person, of course, had had the vaccines, this doctor, and um, and they also got COVID. And I said, well, what are they, how are you, um, how are you being treated? Well, there's no treatment for it. Well, yes, there is. <laughs> and, and of course, the doctor's response was, look, who's the doctor here? Okay, fair enough. Um, there's plenty of things that you know that I don't, but what I've learned since then, and, and I, I tried to talk with this person quite frequently with this doctor quite frequently about the corruption of, um, the medical industry. And I was mostly talking about professional organizations that are, um, their administrators, even if they have MD after their name. Um, and you know, there's, there's bad people in all groups even the ones that have MD after their name. But this is the information that I wish I'd had at the time. So I finally, I I looked up just recently that, and discovered that Tulane's estimated revenue, Tulane Medical Center, um, estimated revenue is $116 million a year. And then I found this incredible tool from the NIH 
that I bookmarked uh, because I'm sure that I will be using it over and over and over again. Um, but the NIH actually has a little online tool that you can use to find out uh, in various years how much money they gave to various organizations. So I looked up 2023 Tulane Medical Center and our university medical center. Um, and in 2023, Tulane got $110 million in grants and other awards from the NIH. Now, that should be part of that $116 million. So if they got $116 million in revenue a year and $110 million of it comes from the NIH, then whatever the NIH tells you the way to do something is, that's the way you're going to do it. And that's the way you're going to teach it, and you're not going to offer any alternatives because you're essentially your entire revenue is dependent on it. Now, even if that $110 million isn't a part of that 116 and there's no reason that it shouldn't be because revenue is revenue, but let's even assume that the $116 million is, is operating revenue and that $110 million is um, somehow classified as a different source. Even then, nearly half of all the money that comes into Tulane and I don't think this is the case. I think that it's 110 of the 116. But um, even if it's not, then you get $116 million in revenue and $110 million in grants and awards from the NIH. That still means half of the money that comes to the school, uh, the school's medical center, um, nearly comes from the NIH. It still means that you're not going to push back against that, that central message. And so even our local um, hospital here, University of South Alabama Medical Center, um, they get something like $8 million a year from NIH. And then you look at some of the bigger ones, like I looked up Duke University Medical Center, almost half a billion dollars a year from the NIH they get. And that'll keep you in compliance. <laughs> Um, these administrators, administrators at these schools, uh, they're going to make sure that the message goes down that we don't push back against, um, against the treatments that are handed down by the NIH and CDC because it could threaten our funding. So you have better luck going into an independent medical service or even like here, a lot of the hospitals are owned by infir infirmary healthcare, but them not being connected to a university um, they have a lot more freedom of treatment. But a lot of hospitals in this country are connected to a university or, uh, or some kind of research center. Um, and all of those are getting a lot of money from the NIH. And that money is used to control these messages, to control the treatments that are offered, um, and uh, to ensure compliance with, with central command, as it were. Uh, I did want to at this point, um, play a clip. This will also give my voice a moment to rest. Um, from the DNC, and you know, we'll we'll talk a little bit about Harris and the DNC and um, RFKJ uh, dropping out and so forth later in this week. I'm sure that those will be some of the topics. But this this particular. Um, part of the speech from Hillary Clinton it really struck me. And considering the, the topic here, um, I wanted to play it. But before I do, on you know, the use of this money to control the, these various medical facilities, I, it, it sounds crazy, but I wanted to point out there's a, um, a Dr. Peter Duesberg... He's a cancer researcher, and for a very long time, um, he was well-funded by the NIH um, through grants and awards for his research. But then, um, in the 80s, he brought up real questions about whether HIV led to AIDS. And this was severely off-message, as I said uh, Robert Gallo at the NIH claimed to find the link between HIV and AIDS, even though he stole that idea from Luc Montagnier. And, and actually, since then, Montagnier has um, come around to question the link between HIV and AIDS. Um, some of these guys are 
C H I V actually is another opportunistic infection rather than um, than the preliminary virus that leads to the immunodeficiency syndrome and the and I guess probably the primary um, alternative theory is that it's um, it's heavy drug use that leads to the immunodeficiency syndrome and that it's uh, so prevalent in the homosexual population because um, amyl nitrate is the primary culprit and but. That's beside the point. The point is this, um, that Duisburg was a well-respected physician um, who had never had a grant turned down by the NIH until he questioned one of these, one of these big rules, um, this big important idea that HIV leads to AIDS. And after he made that question and, and pursued it, that um, he lost all funding and they have never given him another grant research grant or award ever since. So they do use this money punitively if they, if they feel it necessary. Um, that's an example to everybody else. And so, all right, anyway, let's play this Clinton clip. What do I see? I see freedom. I see the freedom to make our own decisions about our health, our lives, our loves, our families. The freedom to work with dignity and prosper, to worship as we choose or not, to speak our minds freely and honestly. I see freedom from fear and intimidation, from violence and injustice, from chaos and corruption. Unless, of course, it's government violence and intimidation and corruption. I, um, I just wanted to play that, and I want you to keep that in mind, what she had to say there. Um, when I talk about what happened during the COVID pandemic, um, they closed chur churches. And I, I kind of want to talk about this like in terms of the Bill of Rights. So just in the First Amendment, um, they forcibly closed churches, prohibiting the free exercise of religion. They shut down dissenting voices. Um, they, uh, uh, including, as I mentioned before, by the way, um, doctors, like real professionals in the, in their fields, like Peter McCullough. Um, they pressured the social media censorship of dissenting voices. Um, they outlawed assembly. Well, up until the BLM stuff, but, um, they, in terms of the fourth amendment, they required proof of vaccination some places. They had track and trace programs. Um, of course, the, uh, the lockdowns deprived people of liberty without due process. Um, the uh, mandates, vaccine, vaccine mandates, so, so much for your medical freedom. Um, the elimination of non-essential jobs. Remember she talked about, you know, work with dignity. Uh, well, unless we decide that your job isn't essential, in which case you don't get to work at all. Um, all the government propaganda. I, <laughs> all the government propaganda. The pandemic of the unvaccinated, which turned out to be just a lie. Um, it, it's incredible to me that she would get up there and talk about freedom when... And it's not to say that the Democrat Party was alone in this. The Republican Party certainly played their part. Um, but there were a tremendous number of freedoms that were eliminated, um, during the, the COVID pandemic for no real reason, no good reason. Um, it, it turned out that the response to the pandemic was far more dangerous to the majority of the population than the pandemic itself. But it did make a whole lot of money for pharma companies and uh, principal investigators, and I'm sure for people at the NIH as well. Um, it made a ton of money for some big businesses like uh, Amazon. Um, 
there were a lot of people that benefited greatly from the removal of your freedoms. But the thing to bear in mind is that whether you're talking about this as a reaction to um, a health crisis or a war or anything else, none of that is in the Constitution. The Constitution, the Bill of Rights, guarantees you, or I guess it doesn't really guarantee you anything. It prohibits the interference of the government in these freedoms. And there's no exception given. It doesn't say the government shall make no law abridging freedom of speech except when the government feels like uh, it's dangerous to the public. Um, the, the rules always stand. There's no exceptions given. It, all these things aren't... All, all of these rights are protected regardless of the circumstances. And um, I think there was a real failure in this country during that time. And I don't just mean from the politicians. I mean from us, too. Um, there were some of us that were out there that were standing up. that were trying to, to argue about this, to try and disseminate information. But the, the government has done a really good job of locking down um, pathways of communication. And in some ways, it's easier to find dissenting views than it's ever been before. But at the same time, it's surprising how effectively uh, the, the government has been able to pressure outlets to eliminate dissenting speech. It's, it's impressive how capable they are of controlling the message even in this environment. And it's terrifying. And so the, the last thing that you should ever listen to besides somebody who's selling you fear is somebody that says that you don't need to check on this information yourself. Like skepticism is an essential and exceptionally important trait. And um, I, I hope you all exercise it as often as you can, including with me. Um, and I encourage you to, if you disagree, uh, or if you have evidence to the contrary of what I'm present here, um, to contact me, Michael at thelibertymike.com. Email me. Send me your send me your evidence. Send me links. I'm careful with links, but you know. Um, yeah, I uh, I like to learn, <laughs> so I'm not going to be offended through uh, criticism of the information I present if uh, a reasonable alternative is offered, especially with evidence. Um, and even if you don't have evidence, if you just disagree with an opinion that I offer, um, support your position, make your argument. I'd love to hear it or read it as the case may be. But I think that the this, this skepticism is important and it's, it's incumbent upon us to stand up to a reckless government action. Um, and I, I don't think that it's actually all nefarious. Some of it is. Uh, but I, I think maybe at the highest levels there's a level of evil there, but mostly I think people are just misguided. Um, that they think that they're doing good for the greater population and um, just unforeseen consequences. But this went on for a really long time, and there are still people that have bought in, that are still bought in. Um, there are people that are still out there getting their COVID boosters, which it amazes me that there's any doctor in the country that's still recommending this, even with NIH funding. But um, I guess, you know, everybody can be bought at some level, right? Wow, that was a real downer. I'm kind of planning to end there, but now I feel like I got to come up with something, something positive to say. I mean, there are, like we stayed on the air. So that's something positive. And we weren't the only ones. There were, there were plenty of, of voices out there that were 
trying to talk about what we knew to be true, or at least what we knew to be untrue um, about COVID. I, um, I would speak out against vaccinating now, but at the time I wasn't really saying don't get vaccinated. I was saying that I wasn't planning on getting vaccinated. I was saying, know what you're getting into. I was saying that the claims that they're making about the effectiveness and the safety of this, of these drugs, they can't possibly know in this amount of time. Um, I was trying to tout the studies that were coming out that were against what was being said, the, um, talking about the Danish mask study and, and others that followed. I don't know. There's only so much you can do, I suppose, but, but you, you have a skeptic in me, if nothing else. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, I'll continue to be skeptical and seek evidence. And I urge you to do the same. Uh, that's the main thing. Like can't listen to news and learn anything. At the very least you have to read it and you can even read mainstream outlets, but you actually, you'll get information. If you read, if you just, if you just watch TV or even listen to the radio, I don't think you're going to get very much out of it. Probably more out of the radio than TV. But, um, but if you really want to understand what's going on, you have to read about it. And when they start talking about their evidence for this and evidence for that, go look at that evidence. See if there's actually evidence there. Because there was claims of evidence. And I look, uh, by the way, I, some of these guys are really slippery, like Fauci. I hunted and hunted. Because I was sure there had to be a clip somewhere along the way where he said that the vaccine gave you immunity. But he was very careful not to use that word, I noticed. Um, the word that he kept using is you're protected, you're protected, you're protected, you're protected. That was very, that was very slippery because it gives the impression that you won't get the illness without actually saying it. And I imagine that he never used the word immunity in there because he knew better. And, and it wasn't very far into it bef before it became clear that it didn't prevent you from being infected. Um, and then he was talking about, well, but it'll prevent you from transmitting. It stops at you if you've been vaccinated, which turned out to also be a lie. And something that was never tested. Uh, it's incredible. Um, but um, that's, uh, yeah, that's public health. They, they use your money to pay researchers to develop new drugs that they then profit off of, um, and then they use your money to pay other researchers to study those drugs to prove they're safe and effective, not to test, but to prove that they're safe and effective um, and then they use your money to give money out to a broad range of organizations to ensure that what they have to say, that the treatment that they recommend um, is the treatment that gets used. And generally speaking, it's like um, there's professors in college that would assign you the book that they wrote. You know what I'm you know what I'm talking about there, those professors that like wrote a book that would never ever get purchased by anybody. But if you took their class, then they assigned you their book so that you were forced to go purchase their book. <laughs> oh, well, anyway, that's, um, that's all I got for, for this. Well, I'm, I was going to say for this week, but it's already Monday and we're going to have an episode in a few days. And again, I apologize for being late. I just, I kind of I kind of got into this as I was reading. And I hope that I was able to present this in a logical way. Um and uh yeah, but either way, um let me know what you think. I I'd honestly like to do more episodes like this, maybe as a separate podcast um where I take a deep dive into a particular topic. 
uh, they would be less frequent because they're a lot of work. Um, and I still got to do research for the regular podcast course, but I do like, I don't know if there would be any rhyme or reason to it. Um, but I do, I do like digging into these kind of things. And so if you guys enjoyed it, let me know, uh, again, Michael at the Liberty Mike.com. Um, and, uh, and maybe, maybe I can do more of these, these kinds of, um, presentations, I guess in the future. And, uh, so, but we'll be back later this week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Ciao.